How is everybody? Welcome to the programming mashup. Uh, we're going to go through real quick and introduce everybody. Um, we're going to do it a little bit differently. Uh, everybody's going to introduce somebody else. So I'll introduce myself. I'm Jonathan Yule. I work for the city of Austin. Yada, 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 whatever. And then, go ahead. Are we, we're introducing each other? Yeah. yeah. This is Susan Barteau. She's a uh, photojournalist and producer with the county, since the county of San Diego since 2002. Previously, she worked at NBC and Fox stations in, in San Diego as a news photojournalist and editor. Her career has taken her across the country and abroad. She's covered everything from the high school shootings to swimming with sharks in the Dominican Republic to making martinis on top of glaciers in New Zealand. Uh, Suzanne has uh, won more than a dozen Emmy Awards for lighting, editing, photography, producing. I still think she's real well known for a great show here in uh, San Diego called Sam the Cooking Guy. It did have an innovative style, and uh, uh, it was a really, it is a unique program. She received a BA in television and film from San Diego State University, and uh, she's a fun person too. All right. Who's next? All right, I'll read. I'll, okay. I'll, okay. <laughs> This is Ben Shepard. He joined Henrico County Public Relations and Media Services in 2004 and is the Television and Media Services Manager for the department. Ben oversees station operations and manages the team of producers and technicians that create the feature programs aired on HCTV. In addition to managing television services, Ben assists county agencies with their internal audio and visual and media services needs. He's held progressively responsible positions during his tenure with the county, including media specialist, television producer, director, and senior television producer director. Ben has hands-on experience with every aspect of television and media services including having produced dozens of feature programs that air on the station, as well as overseeing web-streamed board meetings and HCTV programs. With multiple awards under his belt, Ben continues to ensure our residents are informed and entertained with quality television programming on HCTV. Before joining the county, Ben was a video journalist for Richmond's WWBT12 and had worked for WSLS in, wait, Ro Roanoke. Roanoke. <laughs> Roanoke. <laughs> he is a graduate of Virginia Tech with a degree in communication. He's a football fan, particularly when it comes to the Atlanta Falcons and the Virginia Tech Hokies. Hokies. <laughs> <laughs> His demeanor on Monday mornings typically indicates to the rest of the staff whether his teams have won. Excellent. <laughs> Still not over Monday's loss, by the way. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you. Uh, this, is, this is Tom Reeser. Tom is a native Southern Californian who discovered North San Diego County on surfing trips, fell in love with its beauty, and decided to raise his family here. Tom and his wife, Kim, are parents of two adult daughters, Melissa and Autumn, and have three grandchildren. Tom Reeser holds a degree in communications from Cal State Fullerton and is also an independent filmmaker. In 2009, he was inducted into the National Academy of Television, Arts and Sciences Silver Circle for over 25 years in the television industry. For 28 years, Tom has been the guiding force and artistic inspiration of KOCT, your community channel. He began his video career in the early 80s and at KOCT in 1987 as a video production technician. He quickly assumed the role as station manager, and in 1990, Tom became KOCT executive director. KOCT is one of two nonprofit, non commercial PEG community television stations in San Diego County. KOCT's two channels are available in the city of Oceanside on Cox Communications Cable and AT&T UVerse. Informed citizens who are active and involved in the Oceanside community consider KOCT to be an essential media resource. In 2008, KOCT received its first Emmy Award for the Youth Oriented Climate TV and an award from Amnesty International, North County Chapter, for its commitment to broadcasting the message of human rights. KOCT was also recognized by the Alliance for Community Media for the second time as the best all around public educational and government access station in the United States. All right, excellent. Now that everybody's warmed up, 
uh, a brief announcement. Natoa annual conference vendor schedules are out in the front by the vendors. So if you want to know what's going on tomorrow, go out there, get a copy to see what vendors will be here tomorrow. And now let's start it off with Tom. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. I know this is the time of the day where everybody starts to nod off, so keep drinking that coffee. Um, I think KOCT is pretty unique in this venue. We're one of the only and one of the first 501c3 nonprofit. But we've had a contract to do government access programming and uh, community programming in Oceanside since 1984. When I used to go to the Alliance for Community Media and some of the other conferences, people just didn't understand how we were formed. But there's been more nonprofits providing government programming since then. We're the beneficiaries in uh, about 2000 of one of the last great large uh, local franchises with Cox Communication. I think partly our, our popula popularity in the community helped and the surveys that we did obtain uh, the funding that we needed to replace our aging equipment. It's probably the last local franchise too since the uh, state of California then went to a state franchise. Um, with that uh, funding from the state franchise we were able to produce uh, a lot more programming by growing our staff, replacing aging equipment and um, serve the community. Uh, City of Oceanside was hit hard by the recession in 2010 and KOCT was hit harder. We always knew that if it was a choice between uh, public safety, parks and library and community TV, who would take the hit and we did. So the reel that I'm gonna show you a little bit about is our efforts to continue to serve the community uh, despite the budget and the staffing cutbacks. So we've been very aggressive at going after uh, programming from private foundations. The County of San Diego has some grant programs that we've been successful about receiving. City of Oceanside uh, contracted for the powwow we, that we won a recent uh, Hometown Alliance for Community Media Award. And, um, and of course, we still produce a raft of programming, uh, journalist roundtable to cover local issues. I think one of the unique types of programming that we produce that probably most of you government access channels don't produce is political programming. I'm proud of the fact that we pr probably produce more uh, election forums, uh, interviews with candidates, uh, uh, bond initiatives than even all of the commercial channels in San Diego County. And I think this is what has helped keep our channel on the radar is that elected officials know that one of the only places they can get extensive information about their candidacy or their issues is to come to KOCT. So um, I'd like to just show you a little bit about some of the programming that we've gotten through our efforts through foundations and uh, our own efforts. In our series, The Adobes and Ranchos of North County, we've taken viewers on tours of the many beautiful and historic adobes and ranchos that still dot the landscape. Some have been restored carefully. They provide today's residents with a glimpse into our California past. Our video tour included two historic homes in Carlsbad, the Shelley Caron and Kelly Adobes, both reminders of the once extensive holdings of land baron Juan Maria Romoldo Marron, who received the original Mexican land grant of 13,000 acres, but at one time there were many more historic adobes. Shelley Caron is believed to be the only land-grant descendant still living in an original adobe. She recalls that at one time, at least eight adobes existed along Maron Canyon, which is now shadowed by Highway 78. Kids College was founded by a woman in San Marcos. Her name's Carol Beeson, and she was a teacher at Richland Elementary in San Marcos. Um, she saw all of the things that she thought was real, were very important for children being taken away from the curriculum. Um, and so she worked together with Julie Bramble in 1996 to start an after school program at Richland Elementary in San Marcos. However, one of the pieces tonight will be selected. We have ballots and uh, the community will vote and the piece that they think is most uh, beautiful or most representative of my ocean side, we're going to uh, paint as a mural on the wall of this building here. This is our 18th powwow. It was our idea that when we were 
doing anything in the city of Oceanside or Vista or Carlsbad. They didn't know there were any Indians left in this area. And so we talked about how do we get people to know that, yeah, we're still here, you know? And so we decided we'd have a powwow. It's been called San Diego's North Shore, or San Diego North, but locals call it North County. You'll call it a great vacation. And what better home base for your North County adventure than Oceanside? Oceanside has a wealth of its own attractions too, no matter what your budget is. Downtown Oceanside has more than 15 hotels, 200 shops, 34 restaurants, and a 16 screen cineplex. Host Kent Davey and journalists Allison St. John and Logan Jenkins will interview Oceanside City Council candidates on September 4th. On your way to work or returning from the waves, cruising by or exercising, between classes or having your morning coffee. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Come, vote as you are. Thank you. There you go. Anything you want to add about that? No, I'll, I'll wait. Look forward to seeing everybody else. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, there you go. Tom's work. Everybody have, give a round of applause for Tom. Uh, ben, do you want to go next? I would, yeah. I've heard I don't want to follow Suzanne. So yeah. You don't. She's got no. quite a presentation. Pressure is on. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Richmond, uh, Henrico, County, Henrico County is right outside of Richmond, Virginia, so we're, um, I'm a long way from home here. Uh, we have uh, six producers on staff. Uh, I'm the station manager. We have an engineer and an IT support specialist. Our budget is right around 900,000. Um, we have writers in the PR department who we use as well. Uh, we fall under public relations and media services uh, in the county structure. So uh, we have a, a team of writers that, that also, they work with us as well as um, they do all of the written stuff, the mailers, the newspapers, things like that. Um, I will, I brought a, f a few clips. I don't know, do you wanna hold questions till the end? Or I brought four clips. I was thinking maybe I could just show, show a clip a little backstory, and if you guys have questions, we can do that. Yeah, we'll just, I mean, we'll move it to the end. That's okay, fine. we'll hold it, okay. All right, um, the first thing I brought, I brought a variety of things so you can see kind of what we do. Uh, the first thing I brought is not at all a typical production for us. This was something that we took on about two months ago um, based on a number of reasons. Uh, the UCI bike worlds are coming through Richmond uh, in two weeks, I think. So it's gonna be there for nine days, I believe. And during the negotiations of uh, us, the county sponsoring uh, this event, we were given 80 slots to run a tourism 30-second spot uh, for the county. And this presented a lot of challenges for us. We we're actually an SD channel. Uh, this, this spot is gonna run on MSNBC, uh, NBC Sports, and Universal HD. And so obviously we had to quickly shoot a lot of HD footage. Um, because we couldn't use any of our archives. Uh, we were given uh, kind of a directive of, hey, these are the things that need to be in it. We took a simple approach. There's no, there's no script, there's no writing. It's just music and video. And uh, we're, if you wanna play that, it's the UCI spot. Yeah. Um, it's quick. Thank you. Yeah, obviously we're trying to uh, keep the interest of folks who are watching this bike race that's going to be going on through town. 
Uh, we're going to get a lot of use out of that. We're going to put it on our website, obviously, and, and have it available for a while. Uh, but again, it presented a lot of challenges for us. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever presented or uh, produced something that's going to air on one of these major stations, but you know, obviously uploading it and keeping it within broadcast standards, these are things that uh, we don't do every day. So um, we, like someone said earlier, um, I think it was, is it Mary, Mariana was up here? I think she said that um, to get things done ahead of time and that, you know, this is definitely something we had to do with this one because it had to be checked off by, you know, a number of folks, obviously. Um, let's see, my next clip is, uh, let's see, I brought the N NMH reenactment clip. Okay. Um, before we start that, I'll tell you what it is. It's, uh, we have obviously a lot of history in the area, um, big, big Civil War history. Uh, and this was an event that happened about a year ago. Our county put on, um, we actually lease farmland uh, to a farmer and we took it back for, I think, three or four months to prep. I mean, this, this event took over a year to prepare for, but um, we had reenactors come in from all over the uh, country and obviously, <laughs> We wanted to do something with this reenactment. We don't typically cover events. Um, we kind of we work towards trying to to, to produce shows that are um, that will last a little bit longer, rather than just saying, "Hey, this is what happened uh, last week." You know, so we we were kind of faced with a challenge of how do we tell the story of this battle, as well as the county's role in the reenactment. Um, so yeah, if you want to play that. Yeah. The USCT units regrouped, however. Five fresh regiments attacking in a tighter column formation renewed the assault on Newmarket Heights. Simultaneously, Union forces overran Fort Harrison. Confederate defenders were forced to retreat from both positions. They paid for it dearly, but the U.S. colored troops had secured a significant victory. Their efforts did not go unrecognized. Fourteen African-American soldiers received the Medal of Honor, the nation's highest military award, for their heroism at Newmarket Heights. Among them were Powhatan Beatty, who took command of his company after all of its officers had been killed or wounded. James Gardiner, who shot a Confederate officer rallying the defense and ran him through with his bayonet. And Christian Fleetwood, who seized the colors and bore them nobly through the fight after two flag bearers had been shot down. Over the course of the Civil War, a total of 18 Medals of Honor were earned by African-American soldiers. Henrico County bears witness, both then and now, to a significant moment in American history. <laughs> the good that reenactments can do, it always offers a skewed version of the past. Primarily, the thing that I don't think a reenactment can capture is the sheer destructive nature of a battle. Gun one, fire! Gun one, ceasefire! The artillery fires on a reenactment field. It makes a lot of smoke and a loud bang. And a few people fall down on the opposite side. That's not actually what happens in a Civil War battle. I mean, the death toll uh, in a Civil War battle, or at least the toll on human flesh, you know, wounded and killed, I mean, is beyond our capacity, I think, to really imagine. And as hard as reenactments might try, they are bloodless recreations of, of an incredibly gruesome event. So I brought that clip because I wanted you to see kind of how we approached covering both the historical aspect of that battle, which was fairly significant, and then, you know, the reenactment was our focus as well. So, I mean, we kind of had to bridge that a little bit, which was, was difficult. Um, but we did it. That was a team event. I mean, we had everyone out there that could shoot for, um, you know, four days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, and one of the one of the battles, actually, I, I don't know how many of you all are, are reenactors or know folks that do that, but I guess a big thing that we learned that weekend was the reenactors, when they do these things, they like to get up on Sunday morning uh, super early and do a battle for themselves without any audience, <laughs> without any crowd. So, of course, we had to get those shots as well. They're in the, the show, but, you know, we were out there 
before the sun came up, trekking around in the woods trying to get shots uh, of all these guys shooting guns at each other. It was a lot of fun, uh, a lot of work, but a lot of fun. Um, another another uh, clip I brought, this one is a little more typical of what uh, we do, um, I guess a more standard production for us. And uh, I want to say about January, February last year, or early 2015, um, the media really took a, an interest in all the water main breaks in our county. And we had, uh, I want to say, four or five or six in a row. Um, and we decided as a department to kind of take a little bit of a, of a step to in, inform folks about uh, what, what water main breaks. But well, the national average were well below, and that was something that we wanted to put out. Uh, we also wanted to show people, hey, what's involved, and this is what we need from you. You know, if, if, if the crews are out working on a, on a water main break, obviously don't honk your horn and shop profanities. You know, go around them, take your time, that kind of thing. Uh, so this is a little bit more standard, uh, if you want to mind playing that. Uh, basically, we'd have it open when we're placing it around the pipe. Then after it's around the pipe, we would close it and tighten down the bolts. Uh, the outside is stainless steel, and the inside is a gasket material uh, throughout the interior surface. And when we tighten it, it compresses the gasket against the pipe and, uh, and repairs the leak. The other 20% of the water breaks due to pipe failure, uh, we have to replace a portion of the pipe and of course, in those cases, we've got to uh, depressurize or and dewater the pipe. We replace it with a piece of new pipe. Uh, we would typically use two of these sleeves. These sleeves have a gasket that would fit right there. And then a gland or retainer gland that would fit right here. When these bolts are uh, tightened, they compress that gasket. Um, against the pipe and thereby hydraulically uh, seal the uh, pipe uh, sleeve against the pipe. Yeah, I guess he could take that out and then, I guess we can take the top off right there and we can try to find that one coming across. All right, what we're doing is we're trying to dig back and get as close to the surface as possible that we're trying to locate um, and pinpoint the leak so we can uh, replace that plastic surface with one inch copper. Some, in most cases, I don't really have to go into detail on telling them, standing over top of them, telling them what exactly they need to do. I just pretty much got to look out for the safety aspect of the job. That everybody pretty much knows the operator. He knows what he has to do. And in most cases, we are talk about what we're going to do, what the objectives of the job are when we come out on the job before we do anything. So we'll know right before we start exactly what we're going to do step by step. We got a group of guys, we've been together for a while as a team. I mean, it's a pretty tight-knit family here at the county. Dirty job. <laughs> When we come out on the job and we work together and sometimes you know we joke and laugh and make the day go by but we always get the job done <laughs> the older pipes are typically cast iron it was state of the art in the 30s and 40s and 50s but it's no longer state of the art now and the newer pipe is ductile iron or pvc a plastic type pipe and those newer pipes last longer the corrosion does not affect them as much so yeah, while that may not be the most interesting subject, it was something that we wanted to put out. Um, it, is, uh, it is a more typical uh, standard production for us um, in that it's, we, we assign programs to each producer. They get about two months uh, to eight to ten weeks, uh, depending on, on what it is, and um, they will produce it by themselves. I mean, every, everyone works together, but uh, in our shop, uh, each producer does all the research. They shoot, they edit, they do all the graphics. Um, and then they start over when that show's done. Um, and that's, that's more of a typical example. Uh, something else, uh, the other one that I brought is, is a, um, something that we do. We do a lot of biographies, local biography type um, programs. This is, this is one that we, uh, we have a school named after this gentleman. And uh, you know, it's one of those things that, that if a school is named after 
somebody, then they obviously did something worthwhile. So let's go out and find out. And and what I always like to say is is no one else is going to do this story. No one else is going to do it as well as we can. Uh, so you know, we get out, we find the families, we talk to people, we find out exactly what impact these folks had on the community. Uh, and this one, actually, we stumbled into a, a pretty interesting little story, and that's what this uh, this clip is, uh, the pinchback one. When Henrico was opening a new elementary school, um, Dr. Pinchback's name had been mentioned to school board members, apparently by many, many people. And it was a great statement of association with someone who'd not only been a public servant and an academic, but someone who had impacted Henrico as much as he had. To memorialize him educationally was to put his name on a school. And um, the school board decided that Pinchbeck Elementary School would be the way to do that. And it is with us today. It's truly a memorial. I have to believe that, that had Dean Pinchback uh, lived you know, and, and passed his retirement, uh, that he would have been involved not only in the uh, University of Richmond and Richmond College community, but in the larger community as a whole. I, I, I really think that, that we lost something in losing him early. Uh, when I think of what he could have done as a Dean Emeritus, uh, and the influence that he could have had on the students that he worked with even after they had left the university and been alumni uh, as, as a Dean Emeritus, let's say. He, he could have had an amazing impact. Knowing Dr. Pinchbeck, his encouragement of me enabled me to adjust to the different periods in my life. Um, I feel his influence today. I'm 90 years old and it was a long lasting and extremely valuable association. Earl Hamner created the 1970s television series, The Waltons, to tell the story of a family living in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia during the Depression. Hamner based the show on his own childhood in Nelson County and his experiences at the University of Richmond. I had attended uh, the University of Richmond, but uh, John Boy lived in Nelson County and it had been impossible for him to commute to Richmond, so I was faced with the problem of, the, of, of inventing a university close enough for him to, um, uh, to commute. And so I called it Boatwright University after President Boatwright, who was president when I was there. And also I needed a symbol of, of the school and I invented, well I didn't invent, I, I produced a character uh, named after Dr. Pinchbeck, which I called Dr. Beck. And I tried to integrate Dr. Beck into the series in very much the way I remembered Dr. Pinchbeck. And hopefully I was succeeding. Looking at it from a standpoint of, of the influence that you can have on students, uh, that was the ultimate tribute, that someone would, would think so highly of those interactions and the help that Dean Pinchbeck gave him uh, that he would actually write a character? That's, that's amazing. Well, I'll tell you something, neighbor Walton. As far as I'm concerned, the laws and postulates of physics rank very high among the world's unfathomable mysteries. <laughs> I refer that to that often to say, that is my uncle, when they refer to Dean Beck. But that is my uncle. And that's the kind of person he was. See, we stumbled onto an interesting little story. Obviously, he had an impact on uh, Earl Hamner, and uh, we talked to him. He actually lives in L.A., and um, he happened to be coming back to Virginia for uh, a shoot. He, someone was doing a, uh, a documentary on his life, and they came back to uh, Nelson County, where he's from, which is about, about an hour, hour and a half from where we are. So we just uh, scheduled the uh, entire production around when he was going to be close. Went out there and met him and interviewed him. Great guy. Had a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, that's that's a little bit of a, a sample of what we do. Um, you know, county services. We do a lot of history stuff. We do a lot of biographies. Um, and I just wanted to to show the, the commercial because that was the most recent thing we did. Um, I guess we can have questions later. Happy to answer them. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, round of applause for Ben. Everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, and now the showstopper. <laughs> Hello. No pressure. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Suzanne, and I work for the County of San Diego, and I've been there 13 years. I'm the new one. The other three of, there's five of us total. Three of them are right there. Dominic, James, Jose, 
Andy has snuck out. And, uh, and we are called media, wait, multimedia designers. That's what we're called right now. And we do everything. We, we are the producer, the photographer, writer, um, editor, voiceover, everything. So we do it all. And um, my background is as a news photojournalist. I worked at NBC and Fox here in San Diego, shooting news, editing news. And, um, but I, I, th I think what I really am is a storyteller. I'm constantly asking myself, is this interesting? Would my family or friends be interested in this? Um, is this story worth their time? And I like to use different techniques in different situations. So I think that in government, we have this special challenge um, in government video because I think government doesn't always lend itself to exciting video. And I, I want to make everything I do good, and I think we all feel that way. We care about what we do. And um, I have examples today um, of different situations that I've been in and that maybe you can relate to. And I'll talk about how I chose to storytell in the most effective <coughs> way that I could. The first video, don't play it yet though. The first video is, um, it's called Rescue Riders. And this is about the um, mountain bike search and rescue team. And um, Jose and I, in this case, we went out together and we shot it together. And we thought, okay, so you know, you have your camera, um, this is gonna be visual, people are on bikes, but the, the challenge, the limitations are, you know, we're not on a bike. So how do you keep up with them? How do you get a lot of shots? And at the same time, the challenge is, this isn't a real search, it's not a real rescue. They're just going for their weekly bike ride that they do just to kind of stay in shape. And so we hooked up GoPros everywhere. I mean, sure, I ran up and down the hill as much as I could going into the canyon, getting as many shots as I could. But we, we did GoPros on the helmet, on the handlebars, on the back of the seat. And we had just tons and tons of shots because of that exciting angles. And I edit the whole thing together. And I'm done with the video. and. It's boring. It's totally not good. It's boring. And that's unacceptable for a story that has you know, such visual potential. There's no way I can leave this boring. So I thought, what, what would make this better? And you know, mountain biking is it's pretty hardcore. It's uh, through the canyons. It's pretty extreme. So in this case, I don't normally do a lot of flashy editing and, and effects. But in this case, I thought that would best tell the story and create the uh, the mood and the feeling you know that goes with mountain biking especially the search and rescue team so there's uh, some kind of flashy edits a little bit more than like I said I normally would do some music and I just wanted to create that the emotion that goes with the topic yeah rescue riders and this is just a little clip I've been a sheriff's deputy for almost 25 years. I have an embroidery business. I'm a retired Marine. They come from different backgrounds, but together they could save your life. When there is a missing person in the county, the communication center is notified and the communication center calls me. Don Parker is the coordinator for the San Diego County Sheriff Search and Rescue Team. A lot of times when the brush gets thick like this, you have to stop. You have to stop and look. Today's practice ride is in one of San Diego's canyons, mainly untouched by development. Exactly the kind of place someone could get lost. All right, so that's just the first minute or so of that. And uh, all right, so the next, the next video is, um, okay, it's called Eight Ways to Make, it's called Eight Ways to Make 2015 Great. And, and for this video, it's the holiday season and I'm thinking, we, what can I do? What's you know, coming up? And I thought New Year's Eve, I'd love to do a story on New Year's resolutions. But the big question that I think you can relate to is you have this idea, but how do I make it relevant to the county? 
and I can't just do a story on New Year's resolutions. It has to be relevant to the county. And I also didn't have a lot of time to be going to shoot a bunch of shots. So uh, in this case, I um, thought, all right, why don't I do something on New Year's resolutions? And I can promote, what an opportunity to promote county services. And uh, I thought it's, you know, I wanted to have some fun at the same time, so it's not that serious. And a lot of people, we were talking about, let's have something more lighthearted that we can show and just kind of a feel good piece. And the only shot I did is I went out to the beach, which is, you know, 10 minutes away, and shot a couple, uh, this guy and his wife who used to work with us, and um, I shot them on the beach for a couple shots that you'll see. And that's the only thing I did. Otherwise, it's all existing video that we had, and uh, we were able to throw it together quickly and, like I said, promote county services in a, in a fun and uh, different way. Oh, I'm, I'm totally going to play the video now. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Two thousand fifteen is here, so that means it's time to make a promise to yourself to start doing something good or stop doing something bad. Here's how the county can help you meet your New Year's resolutions. Good, that's really good. Get more color in your diet and visit a farmer's market. They're located all over the county and you can support local growers. Volunteer as part of the Sheriff's Senior Volunteer Patrol Program. Okay, so you've got to see the world. It's so much fun to get a first-hand look at the Taj Mahal, historic Toledo, Spain, or just up the coast to Vancouver. To get started, you'll need a passport. Come to the County Administration Center downtown, fourth floor, and apply for one. Bon voyage. Oh, and here's a big one. Who isn't looking for that special someone? You know, a lifelong connection, an inseparable partner, a soulmate. Find your perfect match at any of our county animal shelters. It's guaranteed to make the new year bright and life a lot more fun for the lonely hearts in both the human and animal world. Okay, so that was fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's applause, yeah. <laughs> Um, like I said, not being too serious. And I got to put my vacation pictures in there, too. <laughs> um, okay, so the next one is this, uh, I guess you could say it's on uh, tattoo safety, like health safety. And, you know, um, we have a lot of important services at the county. And, you know, we want to get the word out. And to do that, you need to tell a story. And, you know, the county provides health inspections for tattoos. That's great, but who cares? You have to tell a story to make people care. And in this case, I thought, let's find, you know, I wanted to do, I just thought it'd be kind of exciting to do a tattoo story. And um, so, of course, you know, you need the county connection. And uh, health inspectors, yes, sure enough, they come out to tattoo shops. They make sure everything's safe. And I thought, let's find a guy who does tattoos and tell his story. And at the same time, you know, by telling his story, you're making people care and talk about his relationship with the county health department, which he has. And he, I'm, since we're not showing whole videos, this is, you only see the beginning of it. But later on, um, I do have the health inspectors, you know, they're in there, they're talking about stuff. Um, but anyway, so here's the little clip. for cleaning the hands. I'm going to work on my client's back for a while. Touch up any areas that need to be touched up and redo some of the outline work. The tattoo is a pattern of ink injected underneath the skin. It's evolved over thousands of years. It's, it's a crazy industry. When I first got into it, they didn't even have gloves. This is the tattoo needle and needle bar going into the disposable tube. And the knowledge of disease transmission was like nowhere. 
Nobody even thought about that kind of stuff. I'm going to be putting the ink into my different caps. Go ahead and lay down. I got interested in tattoos because I was very interested in art. And the intention was to go to art school. And in 1968, there was a crazy war going on in Vietnam. All right, so with that story, um, I got pretty into the, his story. He ended up being even more interesting than I thought he was gonna be. And sometimes you get so sucked in that you, know, you have to stay focused. And one thing that I like to do is um, show some of my coworkers um, what I'm working on and have them come look at it. Because you know, sometimes you're so close to the project, you, you can't, like I said, you can't quite see as clearly as you need to. And so by showing something, I don't do this with everything, but you know, as much as I can. And especially when you really care about something, you know, I want it to be good. So I show, in this case, I showed it to Dominic and Jose. And you know, they were able to say, hey, I think you're going into this guy's story a little too much and that sort of thing. So I was able to back off a little. And so I still tell his story, but not as much because you know, the focus is the health inspections. So, um, they helped keep me on track and keep this story, I guess, interesting, but you know, on track for the county message. Still telling the guy's story, but telling the county the county message. All right, so this next video. Um, all right, this was a challenge. It's a music video. I don't do music videos. Um, the last time I did a music video was, I think, in high school, and. Um, the assignment was, it comes from health and human services in this case. And the assignment was, we want you to make a video for foster kids, foster teenagers, uh, and uh, promoting good health. Now that, and, and have them like it. So that was a challenge, um, a really big challenge. And I thought, well, how about a music video. It took me a few days. I had to kind of think about this over the weekend. And I thought, well, how about a music video? They might like that. That seems, you know, like something they might watch and like. So I thought, well, nothing would be lamer than me trying to write the song. So I enlisted the help of an actual foster kid, a foster teenager who raps. And we used the county's health initiative. Uh, it's 3450, and that's what it's called, something, I should know what it is, but three behaviors lead to four diseases that kill 50% of the population in the county. So we used that as our, um, as our guide you know, for information, and he wrote the song based on that. And this, uh, this was something we were able to say, hey, let, let's work together and change some attitudes. And at the same time, the challenge, besides uh, this assignment in itself, which was challenging, um, we don't just do things for, in our department, we're not just doing things for like, oh, the, the group of foster teens in the county. It has to have a bigger audience. So it has to be able to go on our website, countynewcenter.com. So it needs to appeal to the public. So I needed to make sure that this was something that could go on our website and appeal to a broader audience as well. We, you know, I don't have the resources, uh, generally we don't have the resources to have a big crew on things. So I was pretty much on my own for this, which was a major challenge. At one point, I had to have the social worker drive my SUV while I opened the back, sat there trying not to fall out, and get you know like a smooth shot of the guys running. Anyways, it was one thing after another. And the weather, seriously, was just as hot as it is today. That's how hot it was while we were shooting. So it was rough. We're not used to this hot weather here in San Diego. Um, and I'll say that this was, I mean, just maybe because I was actually able to finish it um, and have it turn out okay, I thought, one of the more rewarding experiences that I've had. Plus, like I said, I had never done a music video before. Nintendo, Sega Genesis. Think about your health, man. Can you reminisce? Social, spiritual, occupational. I'm talking about your health, man. Do you even know? 
I don't know, but it seemed kinda shady Talking about my health and it doesn't even face me Physiological, physical, intellectual Talking about your health, man, do you even know? Do you know? I don't know, I don't know Do you know? I don't know, check it Let's talk about all these kids Not doing nothing with their life, smoking cigs Chilling in the corner, looking like a foreigner Your life is going fast and they don't even warn you Step back, relax and just chill I know you wanna smoke but it will get you killed Need to get healthy and need to get fit Now we might do, here's a little trick Feel the best that you can Promote good health in your daily living plan Mind, body, spirit connected as one If it don't promote health then we don't need none I got a will to improve and invigorate the soul Go ahead, find your group, take control Use your energy in the right way Do everything you can to live life healthy Thoughts, feelings, and behavior Is what you think is positive by nature Focus on this or focus on that So I focus on facts that make you feel bad What you eat how you sleep, what you do, we're alive and aware And we got the right to choose, it goes three Four Over fifty Cigarettes and inactivity are risky Three behaviors, four kinds of disease Accounts for half the SD's casualties <laughs> Thanks So, I believe you can make an interesting story On uh, just about anything And you have to care about the story and you need to ask yourself why why should the public care and why does it matter how does this affect people and you know the best stories are always about people so challenge yourself to think out the outside the norm and I'll I find the results are rewarding for the viewer and you know, also you doing it. And uh, as a reminder that what we do is fun, I always say what we do is fun. I think this is pretty much one of the best jobs you could ever have. And I like to work hard, care about everything I do, make it as good as I can. And I hope that other people care and are interested in what I do. And again, just remember to always have fun. And I brought something for everybody. Um, as a reminder to have fun, I brought these little, or I should say giant, uh, Simpsons notepads for you to have fun with, and you can take notes. And I write most of my scripts on papers about this size as well. Anyways, thanks so much. <laughs> okay, so do we want to ask questions? Do we want to see more videos? With a, with a snap, who wants to see more videos? Snap, if you want to see more videos. There you go. I love it. Okay. Who wants to ask questions? Awesome. Videos <laughs> win. A lot of questions. Excellent. All right. So um, I'm going to show a few clips just from ATXN and what we do. Um, let me see. Which clip do I want to show? Which clip do I want to show? Drawing a line. Let's see. Okay. Let's, uh, I'm going to start it off with this. Uh, I was approached by our trash people. They're called Austin Resource Re Recovery now. They're not trash, they're recovery. Um, so they, they wanted to do a pilot program for composting. And I was challenged with finding a subject, a family that actually used composting. And um, this is basically what I came up with. Drawing a line and connecting the dots. All right, you ready? For Lisa Gerber. We got your racetrack, here we go. That's everyday life. Zoom. For her and her son, Wes, and baby brother, Paul. Zoom. As they race through the day, Zoom. ready, wheelie. Zoom. Their world becomes a classroom of sorts. That's probably good. Science experiments. Well, there's no bubbles yet. We got to add the water. Good bubbles, Wes. And in this family, a couple of talking. lessons in sustainability. Let's yeah, take a blue. Ready? Crack it like this. Even in the Gerber family's chaotic world. Good job. We just need to. All right, you want to go sit down and have your lunch now? <laughs> There's still time. Yep, that's it. For composting. We usually fill one or one and a half of those big brown bags, and then it goes to the curb. Very easy. And there's so many things that can actually go in the compost that we didn't even realize. What goes in the compost truck? Compost? Yeah. What's some, like something that's compost that we put in there? Um, leaves. Leaves. That's right. Leaves, yard trimmings, as well as food scraps all go in the green cart. 
from cart. I spy with my little eye. Something green. What compost truck? Compost truck. To compost. Should we wave? I know it is. Austin Resource Recovery's Kevin Rowland and his partner Chris Gonzalez navigate their way through Austin neighborhoods. These households are part of the city's pilot program for curbside organics collection. All right. Anyways, uh, I'm a big I'm a big fan of Nat Sound at. Uh, City of Austin, we use Nat Sound a lot, and I love it because it drives a piece. And when I'm shooting, uh, like you heard earlier, I'm I'm listening, listening for sound. What's sound? Where's the sound? Where's the sound? Always listening for sound. Um, this turned out pretty good, though. Uh, I met her that day. Um, I put a mic on her, and I just backed away. Uh, like I said earlier, if any of you went to the lighting seminar, um, I love a man by the name of Ray Farkas, and what he does is he moves away, as far away as he can, to get closer to his subjects. And that's what I tried to do with them. And I left the mic on her, and she just went about her day, uh, strapped her baby on her back, you know. Just, it's just one of those things that, you know, you thought, oh, this might, this might be a boring story, but it actually turned out to be pretty, pretty fun, and uh, I had a blast. So um, let me show you a, another example. Um, let me just back this up real quick. Oh, okay. So this is a, a series, um, some of you who were here two years ago probably saw this, it's called the 122nd Cadet Class. It's a nine part series uh, where I followed uh, the cadets of the Austin Police Department. This was the last cadet class that uh, went eight months. So for eight months we would go out for a few hours a day and just gather footage and it turned out to be something phenomenal and it's basically our, our most watched video on the website and the police loved it. And the chief wanted to, he kept saying, can we put this on Discovery? Can we put this on Discovery? And I was like, well, we, we have a channel. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyways, I just said, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, but anyway, let me uh, just give you a little preview of, uh, this is the night that um, Bo Hannon, who was one of the cadets, this was his first ride out to see what it was like to go out for the night overnight. Patrol shifts are starting to look at them as, do, do we want this person on, on our shift? Is this a, an officer we would like to have working with our shift? Basically, we got okay, four different pieces of software running at any time. Uh, the DMAS software, the ABT, VisiNet, VisiNet Mobile. Yeah, you always want to have this up and ready before you even leave the garage. They almost dread having to come back here because they're so far along in the instruction and they're really feeling like they're so close to, to doing the real job that, that they don't want to have to leave it to come back here to finish the academy. They'd rather just stay out there. When do y'all graduate? Uh, November 30th. Oh, okay. Uh, I know what I'm looking forward to. What are you looking forward to? I'm looking forward to being done. <laughs> <laughs> you see a violation there? We want them to start seeing these things for real. They may have done ride-alongs before they got here or they've seen some things on TV. Um, but the training we've had, we want to give them that opportunity to see that in action. Becker 706, 27, 29. Again, we give them the realities of what this job is. They're seeing it in a different light. Good. Last name Edwards. Uh, you know, I saw it as, as, as a challenge. It had to make me a well-rounded officer. And again, geography dictates uh, certain areas. Um, again, we have higher crime stats in certain areas, and, and uh, we do what we can. But officers, a lot of officers want to go there and be, you know, very proactive, very, very involved. All right, sir. We received a citation this evening. I'm not going to cite you for the second, but it's fair to ah, What's going on? No, really. Okay, when you pass the white line or the, the uh, threshold of a, of a stop sign curb, okay, you're actually supposed to stop at or behind okay. the line. Okay? You're not, what you just want to pass, then can't. Okay, what is, hold on. You know, I know that you're going to get stuff like that. You're going to get, oh, I didn't see the stop sign, or I didn't know. Ignorance. Yeah. All right. I don't know what's going on with my computer. Hold on just a second. Let's see. Why are you doing that? I like the red and blue lights that you put on the wall behind your ear. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Drawing a Let's see if I can. This was the best one, too. Oh, come on. You know you won't work. the tongue. Right now? Uh, we could see axe murderers going on, and we probably ignore it for the jaywalker going across the street because, you know, we're just not tuned in. Like that. Male took acid and now being violent. Yeah, you heard that right. Male taking acid. You heard that right. We have 
Any weapons in the room? When the police arrive on, a, on scene, they're expected to bring peace to that scene. There may be chaos, there may be blood and guts, there may be screaming, there may be trauma. So I need you to stay calm. No. Okay. They're expecting the police to be the one who brings calm, who brings composure, the one they look to, to come up with a solution to make things better. Give me your hand. You will go out and deal with 15 different incidents and 15 different people having the worst day of their life, each one of them. And that's just a day at work. Baker 73, he's in custody. Academy was phenomenal. They do an excellent job of training. I mean, they have one of the best academies in the nation, if not the best. And the way they prepare you for everything, I mean, I still remember certain. So let me set this up a little, get, uh, little bit. This is Lauren Villarreal. When we originally started the program, we did uh, you know, our, our pre-production. We figured out who are three people we were going to follow. We figured out exactly what we were going to cover throughout before the whole cadet series started. Uh, halfway through, we had a cadet by the name of Cadet Jones. Uh, cadet Jones was not doing very well, but she was our female cadet that we were following. And probably two or three months into the eight-month academy, she was booted out for numerous reasons. Um, but that left us in a, in a void because we had two men and no women. And the police department really wanted to heavily recruit women. So luckily, because we were out in the field and we shot a lot of video of her trying to get more B-roll of women actually going through the academy, we were able to salvage it at the end. So right before she got out of the academy, we were able to interview her, which you're seeing right now. This is after the academy. And then we're able to use footage that we gathered during the academy. And so this is a year later. This is when she's actually on the job and she's been a year with the police department. Areas and this is the call that she goes today, to. Just because it really opened your eyes as to what could possibly happen out there on the streets. Step out of the car received a call about a collision that happened. A Honda had rear-ended a parked vehicle. 6 and 2, can you log a second 28? This job is not simply just wearing a badge or putting this uniform. You have to take a lot of pride in what you do. 10-4. The driver was still in the driver's seat of the Honda and immediately upon speaking with her, she, her speech was slurred. She had a strong odor of alcohol. Okay. My fault. So you were coming from home? How much did you have to drink while you were at home? Quite a bit. Okay, how much is quite a bit? Are we talking a six pack, a bottle of wine, yeah, probably. a bottle of liquor? Okay, so what did you have to drink at your house? Probably about uh, three or four drinks. So do you know what time it is right now without looking at a watch? If you could take a guess, what do you think? 2.30. Uh, 2.30? All right, I got 3.46. Okay. Being here last night. So anyways, um, she was eventually arrested and they, they ran her and uh, ran her information through the, the nationwide uh, AWACs and it turned out that she had three prior DWIs in New York. So she was toast. She's done. She's in jail. And last time I checked, I think she was serving a four or five year sentence for that. Um, so yeah, just powerful things. But this also goes to show that in this job, TV is not a nine to five job. You might work nine to five, but for this, we had to go overnight. And we did it for a few weeks. We would go out one, one night overnight just to get some video. So. To get the story, sometimes you have to go above and beyond. Do you have a question? Yeah, isn't that consent? Okay, so in Texas, if she's on a public street, I have consent to shoot her. Um, being in a public street, public right, you want to talk about that a little bit too, being a former news? No? Yeah. You, you want to? 
No, you're good. Okay. I mean, uh, basically, as a former news photographer, we're taught that if you're on the street, it's a public street. And you're able to shoot whatever you can see with the camera. Now, obviously, you can't zoom into people's houses because that's, that's privacy issues. But because she was there on a public street, I could film it. So we didn't get Sam a release yeah. from her. Yeah. Same in California. Same in every state. Yeah, same in every state. Exactly. Um, yeah, you got a question? What kind of lighting did you use? For? For these street shots. Uh, none. Available light. Available light. I, um, I don't like to use a top light because I, I kind of think it's like having a flashlight and shining a flashlight in somebody's face the whole time. Um, I will only use it if absolutely necessary. But for that, it's a combination of iris and gain and slow shutter. So, any other questions? All right. Is this news? No. <laughs> I mean, just to show of hands real quick, how many people were former news? Two, all right, wow. that's a lot. Um, I don't miss it either. How many miss it? Yeah, yeah nobody one. misses it. <laughs> yeah, does anybody? It used to be fun. There used to be a lot of travel, but that's kind of, and there used to be two people, now there's one person. Yeah. Uh, I could go on and on forever. Uh, you had a question? Yeah, I had a quick question about the audio uh, of the folks inside, and were you, and you could go in with them? Oh, for the, you, you're talking about the guy that they arrested that was on acid? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> let, let me tell you how I did that. Um, I, I, I use electrosonic wireless, and they give me about a hundred foot range. And I wasn't allowed to go into the building, obviously, again, because it's a private residence. So I can't go in there. But the officer wore the law on so I could still hear the sound, so I could hear when he was coming down. But after a while, he forgot that it was on. So they just kind of went with their day, and, like, and I got great sound. Uh, sometimes it would break up, though. And, but, you know, I just kind of did what I could. Um, but that's how I did that. And, Notice, you know, there was no shots inside, but through the audio, you were able to grasp the story, and that's the importance of natural sound. So, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. What's the legality of that? The legality of... Well, what the legality of that is, you don't see their face. Like, with the lady who was obviously a drunk driver, I blurred her face. Um, the guy, if you watch that later on, his face is, his face is blurred as well. Um, but if it's there and the police, and the mic's on the police officer, I'm going to be able to record everything that's going on. It's different in every state. It's different in every state, in yeah. Colorado, I could go in with a hidden camera and microphone and record, but if I had someone go in with just a microphone and I sit outside and I use audio of the other person, that would be illegal. Yeah, and in Texas it's... Yeah, that would be considered wiretapping. But hidden camera and get the whole thing, the whole AV, but that's legal. It's weird. Yeah, it's it's a weird, weird line. Yeah. So, um, any other questions? All right. Should we see some more clips? What time? I think we're. I think it's done. I think we're done. Do you have any? Uh, anybody have any questions for any of our other panels over here? All right. Well. That's it for us. Um, thank you. We're gonna hand. She's gonna hand out some uh, yeah. Simpsons merchants, and then afterwards, there's gonna be a. What was it? I have three boxes. The reception starts at 5:30. And the silent auction. So thank you guys so much. And again, if you have any questions, we'll be here all the week. You can come and ask us whatever you want. Thank you guys so much.